It is so good to be here today, and I love the statement that we just heard in that video, what we do in here can change the world out there. How many of you believe that statement this morning? I believe that with every single fiber of my being, and if you want to talk about thanks living, God allows us to be a part of what he's doing in this world. How many of you think that's pretty incredible? I mean, the God in heaven, he loved us enough. He didn't just save us, but he allows us to be a part of his plan to bring salvation and redemption to the world. And I love what that video just pointed out. In here, we tell stories of God's goodness, God's peace, God's love, God's forgiveness. Wasn't, wasn't uh, Matt's testimony awesome this morning? That's what we do. We tell those stories in here so that we can be the story of God's goodness, God's peace, God's love, God's forgiveness out there because there is a world that is in desperate need of Jesus and his saving power. I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever valued something not valuable? Have you ever valued something not valuable? <laughs> when I was young, when I was a, a kid, I started loving to collect baseball cards especially. So I became a card collector. And I think somewhere around my junior high years, the glory days of life right there, somewhere around my junior high years, I really got like a, a kickstart in it. I, like I really got an extra boost of like love for collecting cards because I can't remember all the details, but we were going somewhere with my dad one time and we stopped at this random person's house. I don't know who he was. I think it's the only time I've ever met him in my entire life. That's just what it's like growing up in a pastor's home, okay, right there. You're a that's probably like a pastor's kid story. You just stop at random people's houses that your dad knows or whatever. But this worked out really good in my favor because that night we started talking about sports and he found out that I was interested in collecting cards. And he goes up into his room, he goes away for a little bit, and he comes back down and he brings me what he said was an exclusive set of Ken Griffey Jr. cards. Now, this is back in the early 90s. Ken Griffey was like going to be the next big thing in baseball. And these cards were a set of three. They weren't even rookie cards. They were him when he was in high school in his um, like high school uniforms and stuff like that. And they were coated in 23 karat gold. I'm telling you what, man, these, are the, these cards were not. And he said that he had them in their sleeves and everything. And he said, hey, if you hold on to these cards, I promise you someday they're going to be worth something. Well, as a junior high kid, I was like, man, I am I started to guard those things with my life. I mean, that was a sacred gift that was given to me. I was thinking ahead, this is going to be my inheritance to my children one day. I mean, these things are going to be worth something. So then, even I think it was like 1991 through 1994, for my big Christmas present from my grandmother, I would ask her for the complete factory set, the entire, this is every single baseball player that played in 1993. And I had such character and discipline as a teenager. I mean, I was thinking big picture all the way back then as a junior high. I didn't even open this. You, you can see the plastic is still on this thing right here. Because I knew this, man, if you have a card that is in perfect mint condition, and there's guys like Ken Griffey Jr. cards in here and stuff like that, someday, man, this set's going to be valuable. Again, I'm thinking about my kid's inheritance one day. I'll tell you what, in here, my collection, oh, it was valuable. When we, get, when we got married, guess what? We moved into our, our apartment, and guess what moved in with us? My card collection. We bought a house, and guess what moved into the new house with us? My card collection. We bought another house, and guess what? Moved into that house with us. My card collection, man. It was going everywhere we go. I had it in a nice trunk. And finally, along the way, we had children, and finally my children grew up, and they got to the age where they started getting interested in collecting cards, and they started discovering that Dad had this awesome set of cards. And, man, they, I remember opening it up the first time, and they saw those 23 karat Ken Griffey Jr. cards, and I'm like, don't even touch that. Go get your white gloves on, man. You can't even mess with this stuff. It's guarding it with my life. And then one day, Stuart really got involved in collecting cards, and he started, like, selling them on eBay and different things like that. And one day, we went to a card show in Pensacola, and I came to realize that out there, my cards were absolutely worthless. We went to that card show, and I went up to that guy, and I was just kind of curious. I didn't bring everything with me. I was holding it back, but I went up to him, and I, I told him a little bit of what he had. I told him I had these bad boys at my house right there, and he looked at me, and he said, eh, I'll give you like 100 bucks for your whole set. I was like, 100 bucks? This is my children's inheritance one day. 
been saving this for 20 plus years. You tell me that everything that I thought was valuable is worthless. He's like, yeah, pretty much. He's like, back in the early 1990s, they printed everything. They just printed it like crazy. There's way too many. Everybody's got what you got. And I was like, oh, man. So I, before we move on, though, in honor of even last week, remember I was going to give Shepard my trillion-dollar inheritance last week. Shepard, this is your inheritance right here, buddy. <laughs> everything that your dad is worth. Give Shepard a big round of applause right there. <laughs> oh, man. It's kind of a harsh reality When you wake up one day and you realize that the things you had been living for and the things that you had been valuing and the things that you were thinking are important in your life are worth nothing. The title of the message this morning is Vet What You Value. If we're going to live a life of thanksgiving, if we're going to go from faithless to faithful, we need to vet what we value. We need to take a good, hard, close look at what's really important and what really matters to us. Our passage today is all about misplaced value. God's people, his children of Israel, by the way, I believe that if they had modern technology like we have today, 2,500 years ago when this passage is written, that video that we played about in here and out there, that would have served as a perfect introduction to this passage, even to God's children back then. Because what God's people were doing is they completely undervalued what they had of infinite worth. That's our problem. We undervalue what really matters and what's really important. And we value things that are worthless, especially when we compare them to eternity. God's children, they were a nation that was set apart to show the world, the beauty and the greatness of God. And yet God was not great and God was not beautiful to them. And guess what? As a result, their lives weren't great and their lives weren't beautiful either. They're living in in the shell. If you remember back to last week, they're they're living their lives in a shell of what they thought they could be and what, what they really wanted them to be. In here, in their hearts, inside the nation of Israel, they were bored with God and they were weary with him. We're gonna see that in our passage this morning. Imagine being bored with God. Imagine being weary of serving him and living for him and serving him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We don't have to imagine too hard. We can get like that very quickly and very easily in our lives. Out there, no one was believing in God and his transforming power. Nobody wanted to belong to this special group of people because there wasn't any real evidence that their God was great and their God was beautiful. People weren't becoming everything that God created them to be. And they were completely missing the boat on where value and pleasure and satisfaction and fulfillment in life comes from. So this morning, we need to vet what we value. What we do in here. First and foremost, what we do in here together corporately as a body of believers literally can change the world out there. Do you believe that this morning? Well, then let's vet what we value. I only have two questions that I want to ask you, but don't worry, I have a lot of practical applications under those. But question number one is this, do I value God? Do I value God? I know the quick answer is Of course I value God. I'm here this morning, but it's deeper than that. It's bigger than that. Do I value God? Everybody look at verse 6 with me, just the beginning of verse 6. And you're going to help me out here as we go through this, okay? It says this. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, everybody help me out with that question. What's it say? Where is mine honor? And if I be a master, everybody help me out again. Where is my fear? Israel failed to value the greatness of God as their father. Just let that sink in for a minute. God was their father, the creator of heaven and earth. God is not some distant and impersonal God. There are a whole lot of religion in in this world. I believe that God created us with a God-sized hole in our hearts. The heavens declare the glory of God. We all ask ourselves, why are we here? And where did we come from? And we start thinking about God. And many people come to these conclusions that their God is so distant and he's so impersonal and he's only someone to be feared. But we serve a God in heaven who compares himself to a father. God was their father. 
This had been understood since the beginning. He told Moses to go and tell Pharaoh that Israel is my son, my firstborn. Yet let my people go. You know who you're messing with? That's, that's my son. That's my firstborn. These are my people. I care and I value them. For a thousand years now, God had been nothing but a loving father. He gave them life. He guided them. He lovingly provided for every single thing that they needed. He lovingly chastened them and corrected them, just like a good father should do. There's been a thousand years of proof to all of this. And where was his honor? Why don't you love me? Why don't you thank me? Why don't you want to spend time with me? Why don't you ask me for help? And before we just sit here and we throw stones at the nation of Israel and say, how could they? How many days do we get up and we don't open up God's word? How many prayerless weeks have we had in our life? When was the last time you were brought to tears because of God's goodness and his faithfulness and his mercy and his forgiveness? When was the last time you got on your knees and you said, God, I just, I just want you I don't just want your gifts. I don't just want your your help with my problems. I don't just want your healing because I got a diagnosis that's scaring me to death. God, I just want you. Where was his honor? Israel failed to value the greatness of God as master. God's not just our father. He's literally our creator. How many of you have had a mom who's told you at some point in your life, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. How many of you had a mom that you were scared that she really meant it? Okay, some of you in there. I I bring that up not to cast God in that type of a light. Not not to cast him with frivolousness or saying that he's trivial in that type of way. God literally is our creator. He literally brought us into this world. He literally has the power to take us out of this world at any time he wants to. But when we talk about God being a great master, he doesn't hold that over our heads. Every time we mess up, he doesn't say, next time, I'm just chopping you off and you're done. That's not how he treats us. He treats us with love and care and compassion. When Adam and Eve sinned and messed up in the garden, he said, hey, I'm going to provide a savior one day for, your, for you and for the sins of this world. Hey, to the nation of Israel, he gave them the law. He gave them commandments. Why? For their good. Everything that we find in God's word, it's not to make our lives difficult and complicated. It's to bless us. It's to put guardrails and protection. It's to help us know what will really bring true satisfaction and fulfillment in life and what is truly dangerous and what would truly harm us. Just like you as a good parent do with your children, you put up those guardrails. God wasn't just a father. He was also a master. Where was his fear? Where was the profound respect the reverence, the awe, and the adoration that he was deserving of. And again, before we just browse over this and we just move right on, when was the last time we fell on our face before God in reverence and in awe and in fear? When was the last time we got amazed by our testimony? I I love the fact that, that Matt was up here this morning sharing his testimony moved to tears, fighting that back, because once again, he's amazed that God would be gracious and merciful and loving and kind, and that's exactly what God's been to every single one of us. We are sinners. We don't deserve his goodness. We don't deserve his blessing, but in his mercy and his love and his great kindness, he poured out his son's life so that we could be saved and have a relationship with him, and yet we treat him so flippantly. Where was his fear? Here's the first practical application. In here, feel his majesty. In here, feel his majesty. The fatherhood of God was not meant for comfort here. The fatherhood of God was not meant to to be brought up in this particular setting and the way he's talking about it for comfort. Think about it like this. What do you all think of a child who's been blessed to be put in a wonderful home with loving parents and a loving father And man, they're provided for and they're taken care of. And that child grows up to become ungrateful. And that child comes up to to almost spit on all of those goodness and all of those blessings. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about here? What do you think of a child like that? 
You, you don't get mad at the father and you don't get mad at the parents, do you? you? You look at that child and you say, how can you be so blind? How can you be so selfish? How can you be so ungrateful? How can you not realize what's right there in front of you? You know what a loving father does? Sometimes a loving father steps up and, and, and pulls back some of those blessings to help that child to wake up and to understand. And we don't look at that father and say, hey, you're not doing right. No, you're doing right. You're doing the things that you should be doing. And that's what God's saying here. I, I, I can't bless you. Everything that I give, you just use it for yourself and you forget what it's really all about and you forget who it should be pointing to. The fatherhood of God was brought up here to, to wake them up, to wake us up and saying, are we just a bunch of selfish, spoiled, ungrateful children that act like in some way we deserve all of this? And if there's a church that's in existence today in the world, I would say, how many of you would agree? The American church, man, we are spoiled and selfish. God has been good to us and we take it for granted. Look at, look at the end of that verse. Go back to verse 6. I'll just pick up in the middle. It says, and if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts? Well, I'll go back a little further. If I then be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? And then everybody read that next phrase with me. Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. I'll leave that last phrase for just a minute. God's reminding them here who they're questioning and who they're cynical of. Where is my honor? And where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts? In these eight verses, in verses 6 through 14, you will find that phrase, saith the Lord of hosts, eight different times mentioned as we go through this passage of Scripture. You know what, what it's referring to? The Lord of hosts. The fact that he's in control of great armies. The fact that he's in control of the, the host of heaven, all of the stars and the galaxies and everything that exists in space. He is the Lord of hosts. He has authority over all of that. Hey, the Lord of hosts, it's armies, it's angels, it's stars. It's talking about God's great, magnificent authority. Make no mistake about it. There's not an army in this world. There's not a political ruler and leader that God is not in control of. We have an election that's coming up on Tuesday. How many of you are ready for that to be over and done and moved on past? And it's important, and I challenge you, get out and vote. As believers, we ought to vote. We ought to pay attention to these types of things. But guess what? It doesn't matter who wins or who loses that election. Our God is still in control. He's the Lord of hosts. Nothing changes on Tuesday. Nothing's going to catch God by surprise on Tuesday with whatever happens and whatever takes place. Our God is in complete control and has great authority over everything. And you know what he's doing here in this passage? He's calling out specifically the priests. Now you have to understand, he's calling them out for despising his name. Now the priests were a special group of people inside of a special group of people. That's the best way that I can describe them. They did not get land as their inheritance out of the 12 tribes of Israel. They got cities inside of the different 12 tribes because you know what the Bible says? That the Lord was their inheritance. And their whole calling and their whole purpose and their whole life's work was to point people to him. I mean, I'm telling you, that's what I get to do every day of my life. It's a great and high and holy and wonderful calling to tell people about my God, my Father, the, the, the Lord of hosts. He's my father. He's a good father. He's a great master. He's not a taskmaster. He loves me and cares about me. He's transformed me. He's changed me. Man, to tell the world and to live your life just to point people to him and his glory and his majesty. What an awesome privilege. Can I tell you this morning, you know what the New Testament says about every single one of us? We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A peculiar people. We are a special group of people, and every single one of you, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a priest. In here, feel his majesty. When was the last time you got it? Your life's work and your life's calling. It's not your job and your career. It's to lift high the name of Jesus. When was the last time you felt the majesty and the power of being able to point other people to him? And you're overwhelmed by that. In here, feel his majesty. Out there, don't fool yourself. Look at the audacity of how this verse 6 ends. The very last thing he says in verse 6. Y'all help me out with it. It says, and you say, help me out. Wherein have we despised thy name? 
Oh, don't we do that so often? That's, that's so good of a spoiled child, too. Like, how? How could you possibly accuse me of that? There's no way that this is true. There's no way that this is a reality. Wherein have we despised thy name? Look what he says. You offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? You know what they're doing? They're just throwing their leftovers at God. It's weary. You're a burden. Here's my leftovers. I don't have a lot of time and energy left. I don't have a lot of money to spend. I want to save my money for the good things in life. But here, I'll, I'll throw you this bone. Here's this weak animal. Here's this sick animal. Here's, here's what's worthless and of no value to me. That's what I'm going to give to you. What in the world do you think the world thought of their God with that kind of worship? And then he calls him out. Stop fooling yourself. Look at, what he, look at how he ends verse 8. This is dripping, just so you know. This is dripping with sarcasm. Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. Imagine showing up, man, you get invited to the governor's mansion, and you've got to bring a housewarming gift with you. And remember, you show up to the, the um, governor's house with your lame, sick, weak animal. Anyone in here going to do that? You get to go to a place like that, you're going to take a good gift, an acceptable gift, something that's not going to be sneered upon, something that the governor's going to say, why are you bringing that? Get out of here. Then look at verse 9. And now I pray you. Again, this is sarcasm right here. Beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This has been by your means. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts? Now, now turn your attention to what that really should be. You wouldn't even offer that to your governor. Now you're going to offer it to God and you're going to say, God, here's my sacrifice. Here's what I have to give you now. Bless me, God. Pour out your favor on my life. Answer my prayers. Make me healthy, wealthy, and wise. Take my sickness away. Give me a nice house. Give me crops so I can just kick back and enjoy my life. Is God going to accept that? No, we all know the answer to that. In here, feel his majesty. Out there, stop fooling yourself. You know what? We, we are good at deceiving ourselves. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. And we do a really good job at justifying our behavior and justifying our actions. And we think that we got it all together and that, that, that nobody else sees it. But trust me, everybody can see right through it. What we do in here can change the world out there. Is this type of worship, this type of praise, this type of thanksgiving, what? it's not going to do anything except cause the world to turn away from our God and say, I don't want nothing to do with that. It doesn't, it's not even real to you. How in the world do you expect it to be real to me? So do you value God? Do you truly value God? Here's a second question this morning. Do I value worship? Do I value worship? And this week as I was preparing this message, I was thinking back to a little over eight years ago when I became the pastor of this church, and oh man, I'll never forget just the overwhelming sense of, it was exciting, but then all of a sudden I was like, oh man, I am the pastor. What am I going to do? And I just remember just feeling just the overwhelming weight and the pressure of that, and then just, where do you start? I mean, I followed a, my father-in-law who had been here for 25 years and who had led this church wonderfully, and God was blessing, and we were in a good place. Where, where do you start? And so I remember the very first sermon series, the very first message I preached was, why do we exist? We exist to glorify God. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We are created to show the truth and the worth and the beauty and the greatness of God. And then from there, we just started looking at some core values, things that had always been important in our church, things that will always be important in our church. And one of those core values is worship-driven. What does that mean? It means that we're controlled by the desire to show God's immeasurable worth. So often we equate worship to just music. Music is a huge part of worship. It's a wonderful part of worship. It's a great tool that God gives us. But wow, it's an entire life. Worship is about every single facet and area of our lives. It's about us being controlled by the desire to show this world how great and how valuable and how awesome and how wonderful our God is. Can I tell you, God hates worthless religious activity. 
He hates it. Look at verse 10. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. You know who God's talking to here? He's talking to the priests. And he's saying, why in the world haven't one of you taken a look at everything that's going on? And you see these sick and lame animals and you see this pathetic form of worship. Why in the world haven't a single one of you stood up and said, stop. God doesn't want this. Why haven't you shut the doors to the temple? Why haven't you put out the fire? Why haven't you just stopped all of this nonsense? You understand, God does not need our our religion. He doesn't need us. He wants us. God doesn't want to be associated with something that he doesn't associate himself with. And he's saying, I would rather have no worship than this fake, cheap, worthless worship. God would rather it all be shut up. He he wouldn't want anybody to mistake that somehow in some way because you're offering these little side things. You're you're throwing a bone to God every now and then that somehow that that makes you okay and it makes your worship and your life acceptable. In here, never settle. In here, never settle. Never settle for worthless worship. God would rather us close the doors to this church. He'd rather us shut down this property and sell it than to just go through the motions of worship. He doesn't ever want us just to wake up and say, well, we're Christians, so we should go to church on Sunday. We should sing these songs. He doesn't ever want us to get to that place in our life. God doesn't need us. (laughs) Just like, God does not need us. Let that sink in. He doesn't need us here this morning. It's not like he's up in heaven counting the number of people and because there was 2,500,673,000 people that came to worship him today, oh, that makes him feel good. It doesn't feel good because we show up to church. He's not some egotistical God that just is sitting there hoping that people will worship him and praise him. He needs nothing from us. You're not getting any brownie points by showing up at church today. If that's what you think, then you're missing the whole point of the gospel and who he is. He doesn't need our money. That's one of my favorite things that I had to learn in my life. God doesn't need our money. He's not worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth life and breath to all things. God's work will go on with or without us. The, The reality is he wants us. He allows us to be a part of what he's doing. We're his plan A. Hey, I'm going to save you. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to adopt you into my family. And guess what my plan is for reaching the world is to do a mighty work in your heart and in your life so that you can go out and tell other people about it and they can see evidence that who I am is real and who I am is true. And we get to be a part of what God is doing, which is of infinite worth and infinite value. Our lives matter for eternity if we're living them for eternal things. Here's a question. Does your worship cost you anything? Does your worship cost you anything? In 2 Samuel 24, there's a great story about David there. It's actually a very sad story. We we all know David as a man after God's own heart, right? But David made some drastic mistakes in his life. He, He messed up with Bathsheba and committed adultery. And he made another really egregious error and mistake in his life. He gets near the end of his life, and he decides that he's going to number the people. God said, don't number the people. Like He was going to do a census and go count them up. And God commanded Israel specifically, don't do that, because you know why? He didn't want them to get a false sense of confidence from their strength in numbers. And why would we need strength in numbers when we have the God of heaven, who's our God and our Father and our Master? He wanted them just to trust him. And, but David said, no, I'm going to number the people. And Joab, his general, said, David, don't do it. This is foolish. And David in his pride said, do what I say. I'm the commander. Which, by the way, God doesn't ever do in our lives. But David, as man, he sends it out to do it. So Joab goes out, numbers the people, does a census. And as soon as it's done, guess what happens? Just like any other sin. As soon as we're done committing the sin, do we feel good about it? Oh, no, we feel guilty and worthless. And David falls on his face and he says, what have I done? And Gad, the prophet, shows up to David. And you know what he says? He says, David, you've messed up big time. And God's going to punish you, and you get to pick from one of these three ways. Here's your three punishments you got to choose from. There's either going to be seven years of famine. You're either going to spend three months running from your enemies, 
or there's going to be three days of pestilence or three days of a plague. And David falls on his face and he's like, oh my goodness. Could you imagine being faced with a choice like that? I'm in a tough spot. You know what he says? I'm going to pick the three days of pestilence. I'm going to pick the three days of plague because I'm going to throw myself into the hands of the Lord because he's great in mercy. And so that's what he chose. And guess what? The death angel came down throughout the land and a plague started flowing from Dan to Beersheba. 70,000 people died. The angel shows up right outside the gates of Jerusalem. It's about to sweep through Jerusalem and destroy the city, the Bible says. And God says, it is enough. And he repents himself of what he's doing. God was merciful, just like David threw himself on God's mercy. And God allows David to, to see this angel. And guess where he's at? He's at, he's at the threshing floor of Aruna. He's on a, this guy named Aruna's property. And Gad says, get up and offer sacrifices. So David goes immediately and he leaves. And he goes quickly to this place. And Aruna comes out and says, I have oxen. Take all my oxen. You can have my property, all of it. I'm just giving it to you. Just offer your sacrifices to God. And you know what David says? And the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. And you know the picture here is? David sinned. And our sin has tremendous consequences. It doesn't just affect us. It affects so many people in our lives. And his sin affected a great number of people. And God in his mercy stopped the punishment that David was deserving of. And you know what David does? David doesn't go up there and just beg God to stop. He goes up to thank him and to worship him for being merciful and for being gracious. And that's what worship is all about. A worship that caught, hey, you gave your life for me so that I could be saved and I could be your child. Hey, God, help me not to have Worship that costs me nothing. Help me not to have cheap little worship. Help me not just to throw you my leftovers, but help me to get on my knees and my face before you because, wow, this is what I deserve. But you're good. Man, when Brother Ray yesterday was talking about on Friday night, why is it in America that, that we give diligence to everything, but when it comes to our Christianity and our relationship with God, we can just excuse it. I, I don't have time for church this weekend. I don't have time to serve God. I'm tired. I've had a busy week. My job demands a lot out of me. And you know what we do? We, we just, for some reason, we just excuse it away as it's, it's okay. Our worship ought to cost us something. Because we have a great God. It cost him everything. His life and his son's precious blood on the cross so that we could be saved. When your children and your friends, and your family members, and your coworkers, when they look at your life, what do they see? If they see a worship that costs you nothing, don't be surprised if they want nothing to do with your God, and nothing to do with your Savior. And I'm not telling you what your worship should cost you. I'm just telling you, get before God. In here, never settle. Make sure you're giving him your all. Make sure you've given him your life. Out there, never stop. Look at verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure offering. What's he say next? For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Malachi's prophesying here. He's looking ahead to a day where every nation and every people, where his name is going to be great. God will have pure worship one day. And from the corners of this world and from the corners of this earth, and by the way, what a day that's going to be. Can you imagine that worship service one day when there's no more sin, no more sorrow, all of it's removed, and God is ruling and reigning in his earth, and we all gather together with believers, and we offer our worship and our praise and our incense to God, and it's pure, and it's acceptable, and it's holy. Can I tell you, that's what we get to be a part of now. Never stop. <laughs> Never stop being excited about pointing other people to Jesus. What we do in here can change the world out there. And that's why we exist, to show this world that there is a God who is worthy of our worship. There's a God who's worthy of our praise. Out there, never stop. We get to be a part of fulfilling this prophecy. And last but not least, and we're done. In here, feel his greatness. The origin of careless worship is failing to see and feel the greatness of God. The origin of careless worship is failing to see 
and feel the greatness of God. Look at verse 12 with me. This is just kind of a review of everything we say, but look what he says. But you have profaned it. In that you say the table of the Lord is polluted and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. The question that we're asking is here, do I value worship? Do your actions profane the name of the Lord? Do people around you look and say, why, why would I want that kind of faith? There's, I don't see anything there. Look at verse 13. He said also, behold, what a weariness is it. Wow. And you have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts, and you brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick. Thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? Serving God wearisome to you? Have you got to that point in your life where, again, it's not about God and his greatness. It's about you and your own greatness. And it's about how life has failed you. Maybe you woke up today and honest, if you're being honest, you're, you're living in a shell of what you thought life was supposed to be and your focus is inward and your focus is on you. And because of that, you're, you're weary of worship. God, I'm just tired. I'm exhausted. I, I'm tired of living this life and I just don't have energy for you and I just don't have strength for you. That, that's where that attitude comes from. And God says, no, stop looking at it that way. You are saved. You are redeemed. You are a child of God. I am your father. I am your Lord. I am your master. You have everything to be excited about. You have everything to praise me for. Serving God weary to you. Look at verse 14, but cursed be the deceiver. <laughs> Curse be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male and voweth and sacrifices unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Is God a great king to you? Did you wake up this morning? Were you excited that you got to go worship? And were you humble? Did you spend some time praying and saying, God, Help us to see you meet with us this morning. Is God a great king to you? Have you given him your heart, your soul, your life, your strength? Are you diligently pursuing him above everything else? Can I tell you this morning that, that pure worship, pure worship, it's not a particular form of worship. You know what pure worship is? It has nothing to do with what we sing and, and uh, the, the style and different things like that. It comes from feeling the greatness of God. And humbly seeking to express and inspire that same intensity for others. That's what pure worship is. In here, in here, I'm overwhelmed. And I feel his goodness and I feel his greatness. And what I want to do is I want to get it out. And I want everybody to know who he is. And I want everybody to know him in that same way. Can I tell you this morning? I'll just use a real practical illustration. We're in the middle of a stage remodel. Two weeks ago, we, we did this bottom part. This week, they're going to be working on this back wall. They're going to be painting it this week, and then we're adding an LED wall. I'm excited about it. I can't wait for some of these changes that are coming up. Can I tell you, a lot of people are like, why are we doing that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is for variety. How many of you agree variety is the spice of life? My dad taught me that way back when I was young. you got to mix things up. How many of you paint your house like every five to ten years? You just mix the colors up, put a fresh look on it. Some of it's just for that reason, right? There's been like eight years since we've done anything back here. So there's some just variety. Variety is the spice of life. But there's some practical reasons for it as well, okay? So um, one is we have a brand new grand piano back there that's being guarded by those lovely ladies back there. <laughs> Karen doesn't even know she's guarding it right there. Right behind them, we have a brand new grand piano. And Mike, our pianist, is dying to use it. And we were able to, there he is. That man right there, give him a big round of applause. He's awesome. <laughs> It was, the stage was a different height over there and it was just kind of out of the way and hard to be able to utilize. So we're gonna be able to utilize that and it's awesome. He's gonna be able to use his gifts and I'm excited about that. And then I found this out too. We, we have an incredible videographer here and um, apparently I don't understand everything about lighting and walls and things like that, but they basically told me, they said, you have some options. You can either dye your hair, get a spray tan, or we can make that wall a little darker in the back because my lightness all kind of blends in sometimes. And by the way, I'm thankful, for, I'm thankful for people that use their talents in a live stream area 
Because there's so many people that come here, they, they watch us online before they ever step foot into our church. And so I'm glad that we're able to present our best foot forward, moving forward in that. And so we're going to make the wall a little bit darker. And then another really practical reason with the LED wall, we're going to have to move the baptistry out here onto the stage. And that gives us an opportunity to have some more storage in the back. Because I'll tell you what, every single square inch of this property is used. Jack's here. He works in our, with our maintenance and facilities. There's nowhere to put stuff which is a praise because we have 750 students that we get to point to God every single day through a school, a Christian school that gets to, to point people to Jesus. And this, this stage in here gets used for all kinds of different things, school events. We've got a school play that's coming up. And every day and every week, we have to take all of this stuff off, put it back in there, bring it all back up. There's nowhere to put it. So we'll have a little extra storage space. And I say all that to say, just letting you know some of the practical reasons, but here's the main point. Don't even for a second, think that how our stage looks or doesn't look has anything to do with our worship. Worship is in here. In here, we feel the greatness of God. In here, pray for those musicians every week and the choir members that they come in here already overwhelmed and amazed at who their God is and what his salvation is and what he did for us on the cross because that's what needs to be communicated. And if we ever just go through the motions, if we ever just put on a show, if that's what it's ever all about, God help us just close the doors, sell the property and stop doing it all. It's not about that. It's about his greatness. It's about his truth. It's about his worth. It's about his beauty. And it's every single one of ours responsibility to get on our face before God and to ask him to be seen and to ask him to be known and to ask him to be treasured above all things. That's what worship is. God, help us never to lose sight of that. If God is great in our hearts, he'll be seen out there. If God is great in our hearts, we'll be seen out. You know what's awesome? This building right here was never even built to be an auditorium. This is a gymnasium. And for 40 years, 40 years, God has saved people and changed people. And God willing, in five years, we'll move into a new auditorium with all the bells and whistles. But guess what? If a hurricane blew through here, wiped out our entire property, and we gathered to meet with nothing, God would still be here because he's in our hearts. And you know what, it would be just as great and it would be just as wonderful because he's not confined to a building. He can move and work in a gymnasium. He can move and work in a building with all the bells and whistles. He can move and work in the backwoods, in the middle of nowhere in some foreign country. He can move and work in the woods on a Wednesday night right over there behind the gym. If he's great in our hearts and in our lives, he'll be seen out there. And what we do in here what we do in here can change the world out there. Is God great to you? Do you value him? Do you value worship?